Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. It is still Christmas and Happy New Year. That's almost here. We are in between right now. Uh, first things first, let's turn the uh, order of service over on its back and, and check a few things. Um, for instance, notice that we don't start Wednesday nights this coming Wednesday night because it's New Year's Day. Uh, so enjoy that time, uh, that holiday with your family and friends. Uh, but we do start next Wednesday night, back with prayer meeting. Uh, so come and be a part and eat good food with us. Notice that Koinonia is meeting at Shades of Brown next Thursday. Uh, next Thursday. Uh, offering envelopes are down in that hallway. If you're looking for them, they're down there in boxes. So they should have your name on top of them. Uh, outside the chapel. Uh, Janet Matthews is not here, but it seems right to call her name aloud today because she is celebrating 55 years as our organist. And uh, folks, that doesn't happen too many places too often. That's a long, uh, good run. So we'll call that aloud and say thank you to Janet in absentia. Uh, one other thing to notice uh, you probably already saw it. The total receipts in the offering category was pretty astounding last week. And I want to say, well done. Well done on being good stewards of what God has gifted you and us. And, uh, and give today, too, because you might just push us over a uh, meeting budget this year. So let's get that push in before the end of the year. Um, like I said, this is the in-between Sunday. It is Christmas time, and Christmas tide is the liturgical season that spans 12 days. The 12 days of Christmas is a, uh, is a Christian heritage piece that we will celebrate. We will leave the decorations and the advent wreath and the tree up until those 12 days are over. Today we'll look to the story of the shepherds in Luke's gospel for the sermon. And Beth will read it here in a bit. And she'll, as she reads, attend to the details of that story. It's a little bit lengthy, but kind of pay attention to the details because I'll be mining them in the sermon. So between these two, um, between these two holidays on this strange Sunday... Let's hold two words together. Uh, they are the two words that are at the top of the litany. Celebration, celebration for Christ's gift to the world, and commitment, commitment for the new year that is coming, that we commit anew to our lives of faith. Before we do anything else, though, let's stand together and greet one another.
Christmas tide. Good Christian friends rejoice. Our carol is number 122 as we stand together and sing. you today, Lord, God with us, Emmanuel. You came to us in person with compassion for us. Your presence enfolds us, your presence encourages us, and your presence gives us the ability to go out in your name. Accept the praises we bring today. In our Messiah's name we pray, amen. You may be seated, and will you take your bulletin as you sit down, let's read together this litany of celebration and commitment. O oh, sing to God a new song. Sing to God all the earth. We sing the light that reduces shadows, and joy that comes the promises fulfilled. Declare the marvelous works of God among all people. Worship God in the beauty of the sanctuary. We gather to greet the child of peace, born of God's rule of justice and righteousness. Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. For our hopes find fulfillment beyond the manger. Here we know Christ's presence among us and commit ourselves anew to living the good news. We've learned a new Advent hymn this year, and it's an insert in your bulletin. Each week we've sung a, hymn, a verse of the hymn, and today we're going to sing all four if you'll join me.
The prophet trumpets the arrival of a righteous new ruler. A reading from the book of Isaiah. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. And let us now join our hearts in prayer together. Wonderful God, God who dared to become human with us in such a strange but wonderful story. We pray to you today on this first Sunday after Christmas. We pray a little tired from the celebration of family and friends. We pray a little tired from all the food that we ate, and we ask that you forgive us for that. God, we pray this morning a little tired, but also very grateful for all the same things, for the family, for the food, for the gifts, and for the gift that Jesus was to each of us, that Jesus is to each of us. God, we pray for ourselves as we are perched on the new year. We pray that our stamina and our strength and our resolve to be good Christian men and women will stand firm, that we can make New Year's resolutions that we can keep about our faith and our spirituality in the coming days. And God, we pray for ourselves in our own needs, whatever they are today, whether we are recovering from a sickness, or we are mourning a loss, or we are sad for any other reason, whether we can't get out like we used to and wish we could. Whatever it is, God, we pray for those things and offer them to you as well. And we do this with great hope and great trust, because we do this saying with these prayers, the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, the words that form the most perfect prayer, that we say together now, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of response is the carol, How Far Is It to Bethlehem? It's number 138 in your hymnal. We're going to sing the first and the third stanzas together.
Yes, and we, we invite all the children to come up too now. All right, looks, looks like this is us. This is you and me. Isn't all the, the, the decorations of Christmas, don't you think they're pretty? Um, who is Christmas named after? Yes, yes, God, excuse me. Jesus, well, good point. Exactly. That's who he's named after. I'm going to read you a scripture here this morning that might expand this just a little bit. So kind of pay attention. When I get done reading this scripture, tell me who you think it is that I'm reading about. Okay? Can you do that? Let me get my eyes on here so I can see. <laughs> yeah, my classes, that's correct. That's right, Sawyer. Let's see here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Wow. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. Who, who do you think the Bible's talking about the word? Who, who, who is the Word? God. Exactly. And it says the Word was with God. Wow. You're exactly right. He's talking about Jesus. Did you realize he made everything that was made? Wow. I, I, I say, wow, how could he do that? And then how could he be, how could he be a baby too? Wow, isn't that something? I just have to say, that's a God thing, you know? Only God could do that. But he did that for us. Wow. You know, I, I've got something here to share with you in just a minute. Something else that God made. But let's, let's go talk to him first. Let's thank him for, for what he has done for us. Great God... The Word, you are the Word. Jesus, yes, Jesus, we can pray to you. you. You, Jesus, instructed us to pray to the Father. So we know we know the Father also. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this beautiful time of year. And thank you for making all of us. Yes, creating everything we see. We love you and thank you now. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. The shepherds and the angels visit an outcast province of the Roman Empire. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own town to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem. He went there to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing the good news of great joy for the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, she treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Here ends the gospel lesson. Our carol is the first Noel, 124 in your hymnal. Let's sing together and stand. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship. We thank you for what this time of the year represents. This is the season of giving. Let us remember the gift of your son. 
Let us remember the less fortunate around the world and in our own community. In addition to monetary giving, let us honor you by reaching out in love and service to others in the days to come. May all that we do be for your honor and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen and amen. Well, I hope that each of you had a good Christmas this year. I have hoped and prayed that you have experienced the joy of Christmas and the gift of Jesus, the mystery of our faith, again this year. Since we last gathered last Sunday, we have had Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve communion. We have had Christmas Day. And we've had a few post-Christmas days to come down off the high and kind of head back into normalcy. Yeah, that, that always happens after Christmas, doesn't it? Darn. I wish we could do something about that, uh, but we can't. Back down into normalcy. But as far as church goes, we will pause and continue to live into at least the 12 days of Christmas and reflect on the stories a little further. Uh, As an opening to this sermon, I want to say a word about this tradition of come-and-go communion. When I arrived, I was told several things about it, and I thought, that's a very strange uh, tradition. I've never heard of that before. Uh, Wonder how that'll go. That, that was me talking for me, but that's what I thought. And I was told several things. Um, I was told that the deacons really enjoy doing it. Uh, and when I came with my in-laws and with Christy, uh, that proved to be true. Uh, Cordell and Billy sat right there in the middle and greeted us and told us how wonderful this evening had been for them. And the deacons love to do it. I heard that piece. I also heard that it was a gift to the staff of the church. I uh, want you to know that my mother-in-law highly approved of that. Uh, she thought that was a wonderful thing to give pastor, music minister, musicians a little break in the middle of the month of December. Uh, I was on Facebook earlier this week, and uh, I was... Facebook stalking, you know what that means if you're on Facebook, Jeff Roberts, uh, who you all know. And Jeff had posted a status on Facebook where he talked about the different communion traditions that he had had as pastor of different churches. And when he got to one, he didn't name any churches, though we stood out for sure, because it is a unique practice. And of, of ours, he said, one, he was making a list, one, we had come and go communion. And then in parentheses, he said, and they insisted that I be away with my family out of town. It's a good gift. Like I said, my mother-in-law greatly approved of the gift and commented also that it's a wonderful, wonderful sign of the lay leadership, the lay ministry that happens here. Uh, Christmas Eve, the deacons led, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, Also, uh, there's one more thing about come and go communion that I didn't hear until really this morning in conversation with Bill Johnson back there. In case you were wondering if anything good can come out of that men's Sunday school class, this is it right here, okay? Uh, I was talking to Bill, and I said, you know, this come and go communion thing has won me over. This is really something. 
And before I could say what I was going to say, Bill said it to me. He said, yeah, it's so reverent and so peaceful. Yeah, that's exactly right. It is reverent and it is peaceful and it's theologically fitting is what it is. Because Advent comes and boy, we know how to anticipate We do it with our actions all month long, like I mentioned last Sunday. But then we get to Christmas Eve, and there it is, built into our DNA, into our liturgy, that we pause, that we breathe in, and that we breathe out, and we rest around the table that Jesus will make special in his ministry that we meditate on the four candles that are burning, that we have journeyed to for so long already. Theologically, it fits. It is reverence. It is silent. It is contemplative. And it won me over. I really enjoyed Come and Go Communion this year. Um, Christmas came for me this year. That's the bottom line. It came for me this year. Christmas doesn't always come every year. Sure, the day comes, the decorations come, but Christmas doesn't always show up. But for me, this year it did, and a large part of it is doing Advent and Christmas with you all, the way that we did it, uh, intentionally, uh, diligently, energetically. But we did it, and it came for me this year, and uh, and it was it was joyful in a way. I have to say, it was joy, even if happiness doesn't fit every minute of the week that your in laws are here. Uh, joy does. Joy fits all of it. It was deep, and it was abiding. Now. That's my comment on come and go communion. I loved it. But that brings us to the doorway of this text in the Gospel of Luke. It's the story of Jesus' family traveling to Bethlehem from their home in Nazareth. And they're traveling for a Roman census that's called by the Emperor Augustus. And while they're there, you think about it, Mary was already with child, and while they're there in Bethlehem, Mary gives birth away from home in a stable, in a manger, because there's no room in any of the places to stay, probably because of the census. Uh, that's, that's what's happening in this story. And the thesis of this sermon is really quite simple. And it builds atop the sermon that, we, that I preached last week, where we talked about Joseph who is an ordinary person doing ordinary things, you remember that, uh, but brought social redemption to Mary's life. And 30 years down the road, because of that, brought cosmic redemption to all of creation. So last week was Joseph. This week, the text kind of zooms out to the whole scene of the manger. And it's a comprehensive image, and it's very detailed. So let's take a look at that text. This is the part where the details come in. Uh, The first thing we'll look at is Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem. It's um, by no account ever is it a booming metropolis. Uh, And it's certainly not that during Jesus' birth in the Roman era. Bethlehem is not that. This fact is even alluded to in Matthew. We heard that read last week where Matthew quotes uh, the... Actually, we didn't hear it last week. We'll hear it next week, but uh, stay tuned for that. But Matthew quotes the prophet Micah. And he says, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to be shepherd of my people Israel. And Micah said it, Matthew quotes it. And it's the story of the Magi, which we'll hear next week. But there's an implication in that quote, and you probably picked up on it. 
The implication is built into the strength of the quote, as most things are, the kind of shadow side. Micah is giving Bethlehem this geographical prominence. You're important, Bethlehem. You matter, Bethlehem. But in doing so, is also pointing out the present nature of Bethlehem. It's not what it once was. It has declined over time. Um, And the present day scenario for Bethlehem is very much that story. It's a small town. It was larger. And some of the... uh, Some of the larger story is wrapped up in where it gets referenced in the Old Testament. For instance, the very first time we hear about Bethlehem is not in Matthew, but it's in the book of Genesis, because there Rachel is buried. Rachel, the wife of Jacob, who was one of the patriarchs early on. So Bethlehem has that history. And Bethlehem is mentioned by the prophet Micah, Uh, More than once, actually, we had that one. We also know that one of Micah's priests in his house was from Bethlehem. Uh, Then the book of Ruth mentions Bethlehem as the place where Ruth meets Boaz. And without that meeting, we wouldn't have one of the books of the Bible. So that's prominent. And then, of course, the, the big one, right, that King David is from Bethlehem. King David comes from this town. Now, all that to say, Bethlehem has turned out a few notable folks in its time as a city. And about halfway through its history, it really became quite a town. It did. Uh, About uh, 1010 BC is when scholars date the life of David. So David would have been born a thousand years before Jesus was born, roughly. And not long after that, uh, David died around 975, and his grandsons, you know this story, could not keep the kingdom together. It was Israel, and David kept it together, questionably, and Solomon kept it together, even more questionably, And then Solomon's kids, David's grandkids, split it. So we have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. So that happens not long after David's life. And in that, we get two kingdoms, and Bethlehem becomes the northernmost city of the southern kingdom. Okay, And both kingdoms have a new king. No, it's a divided monarchy. You've heard this in Sunday school. So in that divided monarchy, uh, Bethlehem becomes prominent. That's when Bethlehem starts to shine because King um, Reboam, Re, yeah, that one, was the first king of the kingdom Judah right after the split. He was the first one. And he decided that this city of David was important. And so he poured money and influence into it. He pointed it out. He made it a tourist destination. This is the king. uh, This is King David's city. This is the city of David. And Bethlehem grew. And it grew. And it grew in prominence and economic clout and whatever. But it didn't last. Because that king's reign ended in about 922 or so, 915, somewhere in there. And from then on, Bethlehem started to decline and just went slowly into the back shelf somewhere. The history of Bethlehem is still there, but it declined. So, Bethlehem uh, went from big to little, and here's the, here's the punchline. Bethlehem is talked about as large way back in King David's time. And it's not big again until Jesus is born. So Bethlehem has 900 years of plotting, of looking back to its history, of wondering and worrying and hoping 
that something big will again come from this town, right? That's Bethlehem's story. Uh, They hope that God's story hasn't forgotten them. It had them at one point. Is it still part of God's story, Bethlehem's story? Okay, now, hold on to Bethlehem. We're going to move on to Mary and Nazareth. Now, Bethlehem was a booming metropolis compared to Nazareth. And Mary is from Nazareth. And Joseph lives in Nazareth Nazareth before they come for the census. Um, About all we know about Nazareth comes from lore and local history. Do you know how many times Nazareth is mentioned in the Old Testament? Zero. Not once. Uh, Bethlehem is a big town compared to Nazareth. Uh, it's Nazareth, what we know is that it's situated halfway up a hill uh, in the northern part of Judah, and that 15 miles away is the Sea of Galilee. And from Nazareth, you can see the valley and two mountains from this little city that's up halfway up a hill. The Jezreel Valley opens up. You can see the whole thing. And Mount Tabor and Mount Carmel are the two mountains you can see from Nazareth. It's a very beautiful, natural, expanse of land, but then there's all those comments that people make about Nazareth. You remember the one that Nathaniel says to Philip in John's Gospel, right? They, they're talking about Jesus. Nazareth, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of that town? Nathaniel was probably talking about the size of Nazareth. It was very small. And he was probably talking about the lack of a rich history of this little town halfway up a mountain. Uh, But it stings nonetheless. And Mary is from Nazareth. And Joseph moves to Nazareth and meets Mary there. And Jesus grows up in Nazareth. That's got to be where he grew up. They go back and forth to Egypt, but that's where they plant. And Jesus doesn't leave Nazareth until he becomes ready to start his career. And then he goes off to Capernaum. So Nazareth... As much as the people in Bethlehem were asking the question, the people in Nazareth have to be asking, can God's story of redemption, that great story with kings and and shepherds and lights, matter to us? Little unincorporated Nazareth, a few miles south on the road from Bethlehem. Okay, Bethlehem, Nazareth, Mary, Nazareth, Joseph, we talked about last week. The next thing is, of course, the shepherds. This is what this passage seems to be about. And to me, uh, shepherding is kind of like farming. Okay, it's close enough. But with farming, like shepherding and farming, uh, there's a rich metaphorical Uh, structure around these two things. And what I mean by that is people that aren't shepherds and aren't farmers love to talk about how wonderful it is to be a shepherd and a farmer, right? Think about it. Uh, Shepherd is throughout the entire Bible. God is called a shepherd. Kings are called shepherds. If they're good, they're called wise. If they're bad, they're called wicked, but they're still called shepherds. Kings are called shepherds, prophets are called shepherds, priests and rabbis. God is called the good shepherd. And, of course, Jesus is called the shepherd who takes care of his sheep. Shepherd has this very rich metaphorical uh, life about it. But in practice, as you know, if you stood out here in the cold at the live nativity, shepherding was hard work. It really was. Like farming is hard work. It, you know, there's the piece that says, well, I'm making my living off the land. I'm making my living with my hands. And that's true. But those hands have dirt under the fingernails that doesn't come out. And those hands are calloused. 
and that face has lines in it from the cold wind. Shepherding and farming, it's a good image, but it's hard work. Now, the shepherds that came to Jesus' uh, manger are not the shepherds that own something, probably. The reason I say that is because the owning shepherds are usually the ones that are back at the house. The shepherds that are hired are the ones that stay in the field night after night and day after day. They carry the big stick that Betty handed me as I headed out to the street side here. That's to herd the sheep. They also carry a club and a sling because they might have to fight off thieves. They might have to fight off cougars and wild animals. And, uh, and that's hard. That's hard work. Shepherding is difficult work. And these shepherds are watching their flocks by night. And they get visited by the angel. These lowly shepherds are the ones that God pushes in to the manger scene. The thesis of this sermon is rather simple. Last week we looked at Joseph individually, and this week the image zooms out so that we can see the whole nativity, the whole manger, and so that we can see not Joseph's side of the story, but God's side of the story. And you've already heard hints of that, I hope. You see, when I read this story this week and researched the characters and the setting in this story, it started to sound eerily familiar to me. Do you hear it too, is my question. Almost as if the scripture is speaking through its historical particularity, through its context, to ours here in the once deemed Pittsburgh of the South. Do you hear that story? Almost as if Luke is speaking through that historical context right in our own time, not to shepherds, but to humble coal miners and small business owners. It's not that far of a reach, I don't think. Do do you hear it, that story, almost as if the Bible isn't speaking about Bethlehem or Nazareth at all? Almost as if it is saying that God can bring about God's kingdom anywhere God chooses. Isn't that the thrust of this story? It's small town and smaller town. It's carpenter that might be a business owner and shepherd who's an employee. How small can we get? How the least of these can we get in this story? The message, though, I think overlaps. The message is that God can bring about the kingdom of God wherever God chooses. Uh, And that God chooses the humble and the meek and the lowly almost every time over the powerful, the sophisticated, and the renowned. I heard it as I studied this week. I heard those overtones, and I thought of you. I thought of us. For surely, surely, if God can use a young man with dreams and a younger woman with child, if God can use a stable and a handful of humble servants, if God can use Bethlehem and Nazareth, to tell the story of all redemption, of all redemption, then surely God can use retired teachers and contractors. Surely God can use a historic downtown church and a handful or two handfuls of Baptists. And surely God can use Middlesboro and Speedwell. That would be Nazareth from here, I think. Speedwell, unincorporated and all. Surely God can use all of those, just like God used all of these, to tell the story of redemption, to bring about the kingdom of God, not just 2,000 years ago, but right here, 
in our time and in our place. I'm convinced that what if each of these figures in Scripture had just chosen like they did, if they had not chosen, it would have been a different story, like we talked about Joseph. I'm convinced that they have in common their willingness to choose yes to God, to be a disciple, to be diligent in their spirituality, whatever things look like. That's the story of the text. And friends, we can do that too. I've seen us do it since I've been here. And now I'm asking us to do it again. New Year's is coming. We always make resolutions. We don't keep most of them. But let's make one this morning that in the coming year, we will strive above all else, like this handful of people at this nativity, to be faithful to God beyond all belief. Amen. Our carol of blessing is number 126, Angels from the Realms of Glory. We'll stand together and sing verses 1 and 2. Baptists called it a, uh, a recommitment, rededication of your life. And that's my hope for us in 2014. And so, as we head that direction from here to New Year's, remember, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, each of you. May the Lord lift up His countenance to all of us, and as we strive and reach, give us peace. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.